Alright, today is Thursday, August 11th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We're going to talk about the lies from the administration regarding inflation, what's going on with food inflation, and most importantly, the delusion of the stock market versus the Fed versus the bond market. We're going to cover it all. But without further ado, here it is, in focus tonight. Zero inflation. This is what Joey B said. No inflation. It's gone. It's over now. But did it really? Well, yesterday's inflation reading, the CPI came out at 8.5% inflation year over year. And when we strip away energy and food, the inflation rate known as core inflation, came out at around 6% year over year. I don't see zero here. And by the way, when people talk about peak inflation, look at this chart. We got a dip in inflation from March to April, and immediately that was made up for and then some in the next reading. So this false sense of security of saying that this is peak inflation, who's to say that we're not going to see inflation moving higher again. And the reason is, when we look at the breakdown of the CPI that we got yesterday, pretty much every single category moved higher month over month. We're not even talking year over year. From cereal, bakery products, up 2% month over month. Electricity costs, up 1.9% month over month. Dairy, up 1.7% month over month. And the list goes on and on and on. Now, the categories that went down month over month happen to be mostly energy-related goods and services. Why? Because energy commodities went went down in price month over month. But if you know anything about commodities trading, I've been trading commodities since I was a toddler. These prices can perk up higher again just as easily as they went down. So this is a false sense of security to say that inflation is down or peaking or even more outrageous at zero, when pretty much every single category in the CPI went higher month over month. We're not even talking year over year. On top of that, the Cleveland Fed uses the trimmed mean CPI formula. And if we use that method, we have the highest inflation reading on record since the Cleveland trimmed mean CPI started in 1984. On top of that, we will look at the month over month reading of the trimmed mean CPI according to the Cleveland Fed. Yes, the reading went down month over month, but we've seen these readings go down for a little while only for the CPI to pop higher again, and hence the false sense of security, specifically when the majority of the drop in the CPI came from the drop in energy commodities. We will look at the Atlanta Sticky Fed CPI. Once again, even though the reading went down month over month, this reading remains at the highest levels since the 1980s. But despite all of these facts, this is what the President of the United States said regarding inflation yesterday. Take a look. Before I begin today, I want to say a word about the news that came out today relative to the economy. Actually, I just want to say a number. Zero. Today, we received news that our economy had zero percent inflation in the month of July. Zero percent. Now, the president is misrepresenting facts here. Perhaps he is referring to the month-over-month -month reading of the CPI, the headline CPI, not the core, which came out pretty much flat month-over-month, -month, yet be it the highest reading in more than 40 years. And even the Wall Street Journal editorial board came out today and said, zero inflation, question mark, not quite. And look at the sub-headline here. Real average weekly earnings are still down 3.6% year over year. Nothing to celebrate here when the average worker is down 3.6% in their wages because inflation remains way too hot. But of course, President Joey B. got his advice from former President of the United States and Epstein associate Bill Clinton, who told him to take credit for nothing, for an inflation that went pretty much flat month over month, yet it remains at the highest level in 40 years. The problem is, it's going to come back and bite him right in the ass. If commodities prices, specifically energy commodities, move slightly higher in the month of August, the next CPI will come way too hot, and all of this talk about peak inflation and zero inflation will come out to embarrass President Joey B. Of course, he's not going to be embarrassed because he has no shame at all. And better yet, he cannot even remember what his own name is. So he's not going to remember that he said zero inflation. So that's that. And is this really zero inflation, Mr. President, when we have rent inflation at almost 40% in Miami? And mind you, this is the cooked number. In reality, inflation is way higher. For example, in my city of San Diego, it says inflation is at 16.5%. And I showed you the real data before. The real inflation in San Diego 
is over 20%. The average rent is exceeding $4,000 a month in the city of San Diego. So again, is this zero inflation? Or what's up with the false sense of security of saying that this is peak inflation, the worst is behind us? Tell that to the average American family that is struggling to pay these insane rates and rents. Or better yet, what they're facing at the grocery store when food inflation went higher month over month by over 1%, let alone the stunning rate of inflation year over year. Matter of fact, food inflation is the highest since 1979. Eggs alone are up over 40% year over year. And this is pushing a lot of families to resort to food banks. Take a look. So long lines are back at food banks across the United States. Uh, right now, the pandemic created an unprecedented need among families. And now they're hit with more setbacks because inflation is making everything, your food, your rent, your medication, gas, more expensive. Gabe Cohen reports on food banks facing critical shortages again. Thank you so much. Jean Vaccarino has turned to food banks after months of choosing between groceries and her heart medicine. I will probably be homeless by next year because of the rent has tripled. She says she's been living on disability for the past few years, making it harder to make ends meet. I can't buy clothes. I can't buy for my grandchildren. You can't buy anything. You know, it's it's day to day, and you just hope and pray for the best. With rising inflation, the average American is spending nearly $500 more per month, including 78 more on food, toughest for those living paycheck to paycheck. In a June poll, 60% of lower income households said grocery prices were a major problem. So millions are turning to food banks for help. Some pantries say they're serving 50% more people than a year ago. Long lines in Phoenix mirror the worst days of the pandemic. In San Antonio, one third of these people are here for the first time. These are families that are working, but they are just not making enough to put food on the table at the end of the day. It's nearly time to close up for the day inside the Colonial Neighborhood Council. What donations have come in are on the shelf. The food baskets are ready, but the folks here know the days ahead will be busy. Every day has been just an exorbitant amount of people, so it's it doesn't even matter if, you know, summertime, fall, whenever. Sandy Fryer has been working to help those in need for three decades and has never seen a summer like this. Soups are down, cereals are down. Those cheaper foods, canned peas and beans, well, they have those. But meats and other proteins are in demand, not just here, but in food pantries all over the country. According to Feeding America, a nationwide nonprofit that networks across the country to decrease food insecurity, food is one of the items that's worst hit by the highest inflation in four decades. Mix that with high gas prices, rent, and other essentials, there's not a lot of room for people who are just getting by. Now, amidst the tragedy, maybe we can find some silver lining here. And here it is. With inflation at a four decade high, home cooked meals now cost 12% more than a year ago. Now some Americans have turned to growing their own food to shrink their grocery bill. Here's CBS's Janet Shamlian. When Beth Brown needs groceries, she often does her shopping in her own backyard. What do you think you're saving on groceries? Every month, probably $400. And it is like a well-stocked produce section. Among what's growing, lettuce, squash, tomatoes, and cantaloupe. The nurse and single mom of two boys says she's trying to save everywhere she can as prices skyrocket. The average U.S. household in June spent $51 more on groceries than a year ago. Folks are now resorting to planting food in their own backyards, and I encourage everybody who's capable of doing that to do it. I do it. Gardening is fun. But it also comes handy in this kind of situation when you go to the grocery store, the prices of vegetables, fruits, herbs, absolutely insane. It's a lot cheaper to grow these items in your own backyard. I have tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, herbs. Last year I had cantaloupes, strawberries. This year I have pineapples. Beside being fun, it saves you a lot of money at the grocery store. The problem is not a lot of families have backyards or the weather that supports growing your own food. And that is a big problem 
assuming that food inflation will continue to move on. And it's not going to get better anytime soon, folks. This is a chart from Jim Bianco, and it shows that even if CPI inflation doesn't increase at all, it will still be ahead of the Fed's target of 2% by 2023. So we're not through with this crisis at all. We're not even close. And the Fed has an important choice to make here. Either they tackle this inflation seriously and aggressively and risk the economy tipping into a recession or accept this high level of inflation to last for a long, long time. In other words, stagflation in order to keep unemployment low. But unfortunately, what the Fed is doing right now is absolute delusion. The Fed still believe that they can have their cake and eat it too. They can reduce inflation without creating a recession or higher unemployment. It's not going to work that way. The problem is a lot of these Fed presidents, I call them Fed zombies because that's what they really are. They're brainless zombies, but they're confused. They're all over the place. They're sending mixed signals all over the place. Yesterday, we had two Fed presidents from Chicago and Minneapolis saying we will do whatever it needs to be done to tackle inflation down even if it means a recession and slightly higher unemployment. Today, we got the San Francisco Fed, President Daly, who a few days ago said that inflation doesn't impact her anymore because she's rich. A lot of Americans are rich, out of touch, out of mind. And today she said, we have a lot of work to do. I just don't want to do it so reactively that we find ourselves spoiling the labor market. She also added, if we tip the economy over, and people lose jobs that we haven't really made them better off. Well, this is the delusion. You want your cake and you want to eat it too. You think you're going to tackle inflation by raising interest rates significantly higher, doing what it needs to be done to tackle inflation, yet somehow the labor market is not going to be damaged? That's absolute delusion. And by the way, if you do nothing about inflation and you stop acting aggressively in raising interest rates, which needs to be done to tackle inflation, what's going to happen is the natural evolution of inflation, from inflation to stagflation, where we see inflation slowing down, yet sticking at unacceptable levels, while the economy slows down and deteriorates. And that means job losses anyways. So the geniuses at the Fed better react now because acting aggressively now while the labor market remains hot and intact will lessen the severity of the upcoming recession. But if the Fed plays this game of wanting their, their cake and eat it too, what they're going to find themselves in is a stagflationary environment with high inflation yet a weakening economy. And then they're going to have to raise interest rates aggressively either way under these circumstances. The economy will not have the cushion and the strength to take the blow. And it might dip from a mild recession to a severe recession or even a depression. So the Fed must act now, get inflation out of the picture. And if you do it now, maybe this will cause a mild recession. The unemployment rate might rise to 5 6%, but that can be repaired in the long run. And having unemployment rising by 2 percentage point or so is a lot better than keeping the status quo, which will deteriorate into stagflation, by the way. And a lot of workers will see their wages falling behind inflation. It's not going to be worth it anymore. It is really sad that some workers have to be the sacrifice to get inflation out of the picture. But this is the reality and the Hunger Games type of economy that we have. Had the Fed acted last year, we wouldn't even have this conversation right now. So it's your fault, Mrs. Daly. And now you're going to make another mistake that will cost the economy a dire price. The Fed's delusion and mixed signals is causing another dangerous phenomenon in the stock market this time around because now we're seeing financial conditions easing. This is the wrong time to ease financial conditions because what's going on is when stock market participants see financial conditions easing because the Fed is not being clear and decisive in tackling inflation. This is what's going on. The bear market is now turning into a bull market. The Nasdaq, for example, is up over 20% since June alone. Why is this happening? Because a stampede by the retail crowd, the mom and pops, are being sucked into a short covering rally, which will prove to be an epic trap. This is not just me saying that. This is the bond market also saying that, that this is a misguided euphoria that's going on in the stock market. And now even Citigroup says, that there is a 50% chance of a recession. So I guess recession is good for the stock market. Higher we go. Recession optimism. This is absolute delusion. But the crowd who is buying the stock market right now, assuming that the worst is behind us, a recession will not happen, 
inflation already peaked, they're placing all their hopes on the reading of the CPI, which came out bad, by the way. The core CPI reading is actually up month over month. This is not good news. And likewise, today's PPI, the producer price index, which is an indicator for the upcoming CPI, it went down versus last month. But here's the problem. When we look at July, the month over month reading went down by half a percentage point. This is what the bulls are placing all of their hopes on, that this is good enough, inflation is cooling down, thus the Fed doesn't have to be aggressive anymore with tightening the monetary policy. And oh, by the way, we have zero inflation anyways, so higher we go. But again, I explained to you that the majority of the decline in the CPI and the PPI was due to the decline in energy commodities. And this is not a reliable factor to place our optimism on because energy commodities are popping higher again. Look at what's going on in crude oil futures today alone. They're about to crack above 100 once again. And the core PPI, you see the column next to the minus half a percentage point, the core PPI, when we get energy and food out of the picture was actually higher month over month by 0.2 percent as you can see pretty much every single item in the ppi was actually higher month over month most shockingly food which was up by about one percent month over month yet energy was down nine percent month over month and this is contributing to the half a percentage point decline of the ppi month over month yet year over year the headline PPI is about 9.8%. This is unacceptable. And in any other time, this would be a shocking reading. Likewise, the core PPI year over year was up by 5.8%. Another stunning reading. Yes, inflation is cooling down, but it's cooling down unreliably because it's all based on energy commodities moving down. And we have a lot of signs indicating that inflation could flare up again just as easily. For example, wage inflation is still not out of the picture. Here's the headline. Walgreens is paying one-time bonuses of up to $75,000 for pharmacists to join its retail chain amid a continuing labor crunch. Wage inflation is here, which will push rent inflation higher, goods inflation higher, services inflation higher. This is a vicious cycle that will not stop anytime soon. And remember the chaos at the ports from last year? Well, that's making a comeback too. Take a look. Tonight, just as retailers are starting to gear up for the holiday season, there are warnings of a possible nationwide shipping log jam. A shortage of rail workers is causing cargo to pile up once again at the Port of Los Angeles, a key link in the U.S. supply chain. CBS's Carter Evans is there. Tis the season for ships packed with holiday gifts to start flooding America's ports. But the containers are already piling up, clogging the docks, waiting for trains to transport cargo across the country. There are about 35,000 containers that are designated for rail on our docks right now. On a normal day, looks more like 9,000 units. L.A. Port Director Gene Soroka is sounding the alarm to prevent another scene like this. How long before we see a back up at sea again? We've probably got another four to six weeks if we do nothing. And folks, we say the Fed must act right now because there is a high risk that inflation could flare up again. There is also the risk of the natural evolution of inflation. It usually starts out being good for pretty much everybody. Companies make more money because they charge more. They can do the price gouging, no problem. The consumer benefit from higher wages. But then little by little, inflation becomes really ugly when the rate of inflation surpasses the rate in wage growth. And this is where we are right now. The next step is inflation morphing into stagflation. With the pace of economic activity slows down, we start to see unemployment rising slightly higher, and that continues to accelerate while we see inflation sticking at an unacceptable high level. For example, today we got the PPI moving down slightly. It inflation remains way too high. Meanwhile, we're seeing jobless claims rising higher again. The highest number of jobless claims since October of last year. Likewise, when we dig into the details of the PPI, look at this. The final demand in goods absolutely collapsed. This is a tale of an upcoming recession because the next step after stagflation is a recession. We're already seeing recessionary forces developing in the economy. For example, the oversupply of goods in retailers such as Walmart and Target. The oversupply in chips because the demand suddenly collapsed as inflation moves the consumer to spend more on gasoline, on rents, on utilities, and essentials. They don't have time to spend on buying electronics anymore. The chips industry is finding themselves being oversupplied. This is a recessionary force developing in the economy. So the Fed can play the game of they want their cake and eat it too by tackling inflation but not producing a recession. In the meantime, stagflation is doing the job for them. The ugly way, the slow, painful death of the economy, draining economic activity little by little by little, deteriorating the economic outlook little by little by little, 
causing unemployment little by little by little, yet inflation continues to stick higher. This is the same problem that we got back in the 1970s, and the reason is the Fed back then was too callous and hesitant to tackle the problem. And if this Fed today think that they're going to have their cake and eat it too, we're going to see the same stagflation from the 1970s, which will morph into a recession sooner or later. Look, for example, at the most reliable recession indicator in history, the yield curve, the difference between the 10-year yield and the two-year yield. In a healthy economy, the bond market, the 10-year yield should pay more than the two-year. But when the two-year pays more than the 10, specifically by a lot, that we have an inversion in the yield curve that indicates an upcoming recession. Now, market participants can look at the recent action after the CPI in the yield curve. What we're seeing is slight steepening in the yield curve, meaning the 10-year yield moved a little higher, while the two-year yield actually lagged behind. So we're seeing slight steepening in the yield curve. And market participants might have the false sense of security of thinking that the worst is behind us. And this means that the recession has been averted. But look at this chart. We get an inversion of the yield curve. That is the warning signal. And then it steepens again. It goes positive. And what do you know a few months later? the recession hits. This is how it works. The yield curve gives us the warning signal and then it steepens again. A few months later, we get the recession. So all of these folks coming out of the woodworks, out of their holes, really, they've been hiding since the beginning of the year. Now that the market is up, they're all coming out of their holes, saying that the recession is not going to happen, inflation is over, and higher we go in the stock market. This is absolute nonsense. And now we have calls that the Fed chairman must come out and tell the market that he's not bluffing, that their assumption in the stock market that the Fed is bluffing or pivoting, all of these assumptions are wrong. And the Fed will not pivot. The Fed will do the 75 basis points hike in September and then continue to hike more. Matter of fact, Jerome Powell should come out and say, we're not thinking about thinking about thinking about cutting interest rates. The message must be clear to market participants because this delusion will leave a lot of victims. And these victims will be the mom and pop retail investors who are chasing the mania, the euphoria. And what will happen is corporate insiders and these companies will dump more shares on the heads of the retail mom and pops as these stocks move higher to raise equity and cash. And they will leave the retail mom and pops holding the bag. In other words, it is really a transfer of wealth from the retail mom and pops chasing the mania to the corporations, to the rich, to the oligarchs. Look at Elon Musk, for example. His stock shoots up higher. The retail mom and pops go crazy. They think it's an opportunity to buy Tesla at what? 30 times what the company produces in sales? That's an opportunity, right? And then what do you know? The CEO dumps billions of dollars worth of shares taking advantage of this opportunity. It is a predatory behavior. And it's not going to stop until the Fed chairman comes out and says, we're not thinking about thinking about thinking about cutting interest rates. Last year, he had no problem coming out and saying that he's not thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking about raising interest rates. And we knew back then that inflation will force him to raise interest rates higher. And the only factor here that will force the Fed chairman to cut interest rates is a recession. But the delusional market participants, they don't understand that at all. They think of the stock market as a casino or a video game. But what happens when they start losing significant amount of money? Now, when we look at an important indicator, which is the VIX, the volatility index, which a lot of market participants follow, the VIX is also known as the fear index. When it rises higher, it means more volatility ahead. When it moves down, aggressively so, specifically when it gets below 20, it indicates risk on. There is no volatility ahead, and stock market participants should be going all in buying stocks. It's a false sense of security because here's an interesting indicator for you. It's called the VIX curve versus the S&P 500. We we'll look at this indicator. Every time it got this high, it was a reliable sell signal, which means that these mom and pops chasing the rally right now, chasing the stock market mania, will be locked in an epic trap, all due to the false sense of security that the Fed is pivoting, that a recession will not happen, that an inflation is behind us, inflation is at zero, it's going away. Absolute misinformation. When I talk about misinformation, here it is. And it's coming out of our public officials. And I'm going to finish with this. Now that we have talks that the bear market is over and we have the start of a new bull market, hear this ad from Bank of America. Bank of America strategists told clients in a note on Thursday that they don't see enough signposts to signal the end of a bear market. 
Instead, there are signs of trouble ahead, enough to recommend investors to be more strategic rather than jumping in. The Bank of America team sees multiple reasons of caution. While there is a view in Wall Street that if everyone is bearish, it is time to buy. These strategists don't see that sentiment on Main Street. U.S. households represent $38 trillion in assets, or about 52% of the U.S. equities market, and these folks have not yet begun to sell. Households bought $5.9 trillion in equities over the past two years through the end of the first quarter of 2022. With inflows recorded in every quarter since uh, the thing, the strategist write, historically, the past three major market slows have occurred one to two quarters after substantial households investors selling. The big quote-unquote money or institutional investors are also still buying as private markets see robust fundraising. Private markets raised $800 billion so far this year, a pace on track to hit $1.4 trillion by year end. These types of inflows across both public and private markets is yet another sign for the Bank of America team that the market has not seen liquidity constrained panic, quote unquote, that typically comes alongside the end of a bear market. Only 30% of indicators that typically light up before market bottoms are triggered today. According to Bank of America strategists, who want at least 80% of the usual signposts to be flashing green. For example, earnings estimates are still up 7% since the market peak. They typically fall 19% on average at market lows. During the last five recessions, the S&P 500 bottomed after estimates were cut, except in 1990, when forward earnings per share remained flat. So the bottom line here, folks, in this channel, we've been calling for a summer rally. And the assumption behind that was that the Fed might be less aggressive in tightening the monetary policy, meaning instead of doing 75 basis points, they might do 50 basis points in September. And this summer rally will be proven to be another bull trap because just like we saw back in 2008, matter of fact, from July to August 2008, the Nasdaq rallied over 10% because oil commodities went down. This is exactly what we're seeing right now. Yet shortly after that, we got the crash and the recession. And we're here seeing a similar phenomenon. But the problem is this time around, the so-called summer rally evolved from just a summer relief rally that combines some short covering and some dip buying opportunities as trades for the short run. This summer rally has evolved into complete delusion and euphoria with buying the shittiest stocks even after they report absolutely horrendous earnings. And the reason behind the evolution from a summer rally to complete euphoria and delusion is market participants assuming not just that the Fed might ease interest rate hikes, but the Fed will actually cut rates. And this is absolute delusion, no facts, no data, not even the Fed support this theory at all. So what will happen when these participants finally realize that their assumption was wrong, that the Fed is not going to cut interest rates anytime soon? Inflation remains a problem and the recession risk is still here and it gets amplified by the day. The answer to that is not a good outcome. With that, folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information and let's start with the performance of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average in the green by 27.16 points or a gain of 0.08%. The Nasdaq down by 74.89 points or a decline of 0.58%. The S&P 500 in the red down by 200, 200, 2.97 points. That would be crazy if it was down by 200 points, but it is a decline of 0.07%. The sector's performances led by, you guessed it, energy at number one, capturing the gold medal, number two for the silver, financials, number three for the bronze, industrials. And the laggard of the day, or laggards of the day, led by healthcare, this is due to bad news from uh, France, but we also have technology and consumer defensives lagging today. The advanced to decline ratios, the breadth remains pretty good, at least for now. The NYSE, 62% advancing versus 34% declining. The NASDAQ, 52% advancing versus 42% declining. Moving on to commodities, look at what's going on here. Crude oil is blasting higher. The WTI and Brent both scoring gains of over 2% today, while the gasoline RBOB was pretty much flattish for the day. On the other hand, we have gains of about 2% for heating oil futures, and the party boy, natural gas, scoring gains of about 6.25% today alone. What peak inflation, right? And we have more tailwinds coming for crude oil, by the way. For example, a huge headwind for crude to go down last month was the premium of crude over Russian crude oil. India and China have been buying Russian Urals at a discount 
to crude oil brand or even the WTI, and that caused crude oil futures to go down. But now the premium over Russian oil is shrinking, and therefore we will see demand flocking back to Brent and the WTI, and this will cause crude oil futures to move higher. And even Goldman Sachs said today that gasoline and oil prices should bounce back through the end of the year as the market still needs to balance rising demand and tight supplies, and they give the target as 130 bucks a barrel by year end. So again, the false sense of security of saying that inflation is peaking or inflation is going down, the Fed has to pivot, all of that is going to come back and bite you right in the ass. Back to the futures, what about softs? Lumbar is taking a break today, down about 1%, and cocoa futures flattish for the day while we have gains, led by cotton futures, look at that, trading above 100 once again, scoring gains of about 4% today alone. All of that disinflation can reinflate just as easily again. We also have gains for coffee futures, coffee continues to blast higher, scoring gains of over 1.5% today alone. Then we have more modest gains for sugar, about 1%, and OJ futures of about half a percentage point. Metals, look at that, gold and silver down for the day as the dollar starts to move higher again. Yet we still have gains, modest gains of about 1% to 1.5% for platinum, copper, and palladium futures. Pull a chart of palladium, by the way, and look at how that disinflation went poof, gone. Palladium is moving higher again. What about meats? Flattish across the board. No notable action here. Be it live cattle and lean hogs futures in the green. On the other hand, fetal cattle futures in the red. When it comes to grains, higher across the board, led by oats, with gains of about 5% today alone. But we're seeing sizable gains across the board. Soybean oil, for example, with gains of about 3% today alone. Soybean meal, 2%. Wheat, scoring about 1.5%. Commodities are moving higher again. We have the double-edged sword. Be careful what you wish for. If you want the dollar to move down because it is an indicator that the Fed is not going to be tightening as aggressively as we thought before, well, guess what happens? When the dollar moves down, commodities perk back higher again. And that causes more inflation. And then the Fed has to come back and tighten the monetary policy even aggressively than before. Hence the dilemma of the dollar. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, what's going on here? The hottest table by far happens to be a Brazilian name, but this is due to dividends. That happens all the time, and the name pulls down, and then they buy it again. But at number one in the U.S. market is Tesla, with around 1.4 million contracts traded today. About 55% of those were calls. But at number two, Apple, with around 1.2 million contracts traded today. About 51% of those were calls. And at number three, Amazon, with around 800,000 contracts. About 55% of those were calls. They're still buying calls, but the put-to-call ratio is closing back pretty much to the flat line. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticket. SPY for the S&P 500. Somebody's making a bearish bet here, betting that the SPY will move down. They bought the 365 puts for the expiration date, September 9th, with expectations that the SPY will move down and lose about 13% of value or more. By then, they paid around 55 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $2.5 million. And then we have the ticker LTHM. This is for a company, uh, I believe it's called Levent, and it is a lithium miner or producer of some sort. The name is a winner year to date. It is breaking out and it has a high short float. So we could see more short covering in this name as lithium prices start to move higher again. In any case, somebody is bidding for that exactly by buying the 35 calls, the expiration date, September 16th, with expectations that the name could move higher and score gains of over 23.5% by then. They paid around 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $750,000. And then we have the IWM, the Russell 2000. Lots of trades for the Russell today, both puts and calls. I'll go Go with the calls first. Somebody's betting that the IWM will be above 208 bucks by the expiration date of August 26. The expectations are the IWM will gain over 6% by then. They paid around 40 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around half a million dollars. And here is the bearish trade buying puts. I did buy puts on the IWM yesterday and added to that betting that the IWM will go down, so somebody agrees here. Not quite the same trade, but close enough. Somebody bought the 185 puts for the expiration date, September 9th, with expectations that the IWM will move down and lose over 6% of its value by then. They paid around one buck and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker DOW for Dow Chemicals? Somebody's betting for more downside to come for this name, buying the 50 bucks puts for the expiration date, October 20th. 
21st, with the expectations that the name could move down and lose over 9.5% of its value by then. They paid around one buck and 25 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $875,000. Now, this could be a shareholder of Dow and they're buying hedges. They're buying protection. But then we have on the other side of the trade, the seller, somebody's betting that Dow will not move down by then. That Dow will actually move higher and they will capture the entire premium of these puts. Moving on to the heat map analysis, what's going on here? Do we have any theme? Yes, we do have a theme. And the theme is defensive in nature, but mostly going after the inflationary trade in oil and energy. We're seeing some money coming out of the technology trade, the software trade, the chips trade. Even the cyclical trade was not as hot as it used to earlier in the week. It's not quite a solid theme yet because we're seeing the defensives and utilities and REITs, for example, moving down. Consumer defensives were really weak today, so we're just seeing the inflationary side moving higher today. Along with financials, perhaps the 10 year is moving higher again. That helps financials. But most importantly, and listen to this carefully, the re-steepening of the yield curve is actually good for financials. What really hurts them is an inversion of the yield curve because they're supposed to borrow at a cheaper rate in the short run and and then lend that to customers at a higher rate in the long run. Well, when we have an inversion of the yield curve, they cannot really do that. So a steepening of the yield curve is good for financials. And then we have weakness, notable one, in the big pharma names. They're down big time. Why? Because we have bad news from France. All of these pharmaceutical companies were down overnight. And the reason is Zantac. Apparently, the heartburn relief medicine that they have um, has a little side effect we call cancer. So you can relieve your heart, but uh, you're gonna kill yourself too. So there you go. And nobody knew until these mother got caught but they're gonna pay a steep price and therefore a lot of these big pharma stocks are moving down another reason is j and j johnson and johnson they're gonna stop the baby powder by 2023 they have their own problems apparently the baby powder also gives you the cancer of the nut so you better just go out sweaty and smelly there you go we also have an update for jp morgan chase also known as the landromat because they wash a lot of money and they commit other crimes. Matter of fact, JP Morgan is the biggest crime organization in America. And by the way, I killed a lot of career opportunities by bad mouthing JP Morgan Chase. I will never get a job at JP Morgan. But maybe that's a good thing because here it is JP Morgan gold traders found guilty after long spoofing trial. JP Morgan has been manipulating commodities prices, but specifically gold. They've been suppressing the price of gold for some reason, and they got caught and got a slap on the wrist by the government. And the reason is they own the government, but perhaps the crimes in JP Morgan Chase pale in comparison with Morgan Stanley, where a 90 years old banker shot his co-worker. He's going out of life with a bang, because apparently the afterlife crowd is a little tough, and the 90 year old guy needs some uh, street credit. Otherwise, he might get bullied in the afterlife. See, I can make a good lawyer too. Anyhow, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? Flattish across the board, but commodities are at performing. We're seeing energy commodities blasting higher. XOP, XLE, OIH, the USO all moving higher, along with financials, KRE, XLF, the XRT also slightly higher, retail. But besides that, muted picture across the board, with the notable loser being the XBI. The XBI is having a hard time passing the resistance that we talked about what was it, a few days ago, a few weeks ago? If it cracks above it, then it's going to be super bullish. If not, it might go down and then take another shot at it at a later time. But at least with the XBI's chart, you can have the comfort that you at least have a reliable bottom for now because it is a triple bottom. It will be really hard for the XPY to break below that bottom. It has been retested three times under really rigorous conditions. And it passed. When we talk about growth versus value, it was a defensive day because value outperformed growth. In the international ETFs, the EWZ is down, although it should have been up because commodities are up. On the other hand, the growth oriented ETFs, the Chinese ETFs, FXI, MCHI, all blasting higher. So we have a diversion here. In the United States ETFs, the theme is inflationary. The theme is defensive. The theme is value. Go with energy. But in the international ETFs, the theme was go with growth in the Chinese ETFs and dump the inflationary slash value ETF EWZ. But that could be a distortion too because Petrobras was down. It is a large component of the EWZ. Moving on to charts, so we start with SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got the gap and crap, which is an indicator of an upcoming reversal, but we have to wait for a confirmation. The gap and crap got us above 422, forming a bear flag. That bear flag took care of the 422 as support. That's gone now. The chart went all the way 
way down to close the gap at around 420, but we don't have a conclusion after that. We don't have an answer. Whether the chart's gonna rebound higher after closing the gap, that would be bullish, or is it gonna flush down after that, that would be bearish. So it is critical. The opening will be really critical tomorrow. An opening above 420 indicates that the chart went down to close the gap. It's done with that it's now ready to move higher. Then we're going to look at 422 and see what happens from there. But if we have an opening below 420, that indicates that the chart wants to move down to seek support below. The support that I have is around 416. We have a negative divergence on the RSI. It got really overbought in the morning and that produced the pullback, the gap and crap. But we need to see a follow-up before we say that the pop is over. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY. It peaked his head above the danger zone by a little bit, the stiff resistance at around 4200, then it pulled down, forming what it's known as a shooting star, which typically, in a candlestick pattern, is a reversal signal. But we're waiting for a confirmation. A confirmation would be a big down candle tomorrow. We'll see what happens. But for now, this is a stiff resistance. The momentum indicators are getting really, really overextended. The risk versus reward says SPY will have a hard time getting out of this consolidation range. And 4200 is a really stiff resistance. The volume moved higher slightly on the selling side today. That's another bearish sign. But for now, I would say the bulls remain in charge because we don't have a confirmation. We don't have a spike in volume above average. We don't have a clear decisive downturn in any of the momentum indicators. When we see that, then we're going to say, okay, the bears are closing in and they're about to take charge. When we look at the SPX, the cash index, this is a daily chart. The chart is actually above 4,200 in the cash index and it is above an important resistance zone at around 4,111. It needs to pull back to that zone around 4,100. And if it does, and it keeps that support, then so far so good. The SPX could actually move up and challenge the sloping line of resistance in yellow. That is the bullish outlook, of course. The bearish outlook says we have what it appears to be a reverse candle today. The momentum indicators are getting way overextended. We should get a pullback. The chart loses 4,200. Then it goes down to 4100. If it loses 4100, then we have a massive shorting signal. If not, and it rebounds higher, then we're going to go back to the sloping line that you see in yellow. What about the Q's? 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got the gap and crap in the morning. Unlike the SPY, the chart formed a bear flag pattern and it closed below the gap. So the Q's is slightly more bearish than the SPY. We have negative divergence on the RSI. If the chart moves down, we have support in the sloping line of support in white. That extends in the daily chart. We talked about it before. If that fails, then we have closing the gap below at around the resist, excuse me, support that I got, which happens to be 316. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Q's? It got all the way to the resistance at around 13,599 can round that up to 600. The number was actually 13,575 in or around that number, but it pulled down, forming what it appears to be a reverse hammer. Now, we don't have a confirmation yet. The confirmation would be a big down day and a loss of 13,300 of support. We have a slight negative divergence in the RSI. The volume moved higher on a down day. We're seeing the MACD rolling over slightly but surely. So we have the signs for a pullback. But can the bulls, the euphoria, the mania extend the pop higher a little more to give it another shot at 13,600? That could happen. But the risk versus reward says the risk is to the downside that we're going to see a pullback. If the pullback goes down to 12,766, then we see a rebound. So far, so good for the bulls. But if that support line is lost, we got a problem here because the next destination would be 12,207. They're forming a lower low, and that would be a massive reversal signal. The June bottom will be retested again. The IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000, we got the same pop in the morning, gap and crap, forming a bear flag, and eventually the chart lost the important support at around 196.5, but it continues to hold on that support line by the end of the day. So we don't have a conclusion yet that the IWM is indeed reversing, but that could be confirmed as soon as tomorrow. We have target number one losing 196.5, target number two losing the trend line in yellow, and then if that happens, the chart will flush down all the way to the next support around 191.5. We have negative divergence on the hour side. I'm already on the short side, and I can Add to the bet if I see the IWM moving in the direction that I like it to see, down. But if it does move higher again and it challenges the highs from today, it beats those highs and the trade should be off the table because the timing is not right. Here's the dollar index, a daily chart. What's going on here? It continues to hold on on the lows of yesterday's reaction the aftermath of the CPI, but I'm still holding on to my theory that we're seeing a trap here. The dollar is playing possum 
and it's going to pop higher again. What supports my theory is, let's look at the 30 minutes chart, for example. We have a double bottom that could push this chart higher, and we have the Fed not pivoting. That is the fundamental catalyst, of course. But what if I'm wrong? Is there any supportive evidence that I could be wrong? The answer is yes. And that evidence is the weekly chart of the dollar. When we use the Fibonacci replacement levels, we see the dollar at a critical support at around 104.5. We see the RSI and the MACD indicators rolling over. Meaning if the Dixie loses 104.5 as support, that will initiate a sell-off all the way down to around 101.5. And if that happens, it would be good news for gold. You see, gold is acting conservatively right now, not popping higher despite the decline in the dollar because there is a possibility that the dollar is playing possum. It could pop higher again. And gold, as we know in this channel, is the mature guy in the room. It doesn't like to pop higher or make impulsive moves without being 100% sure. So if the dollar pops higher again, gold will flush down. But if the dollar loses 104.5, we have a pop higher in this bull flag consolidation in gold. And if that happens, if I see the dollar losing 104.5, what am I going to do? I'm going to buy the gold miners, the overbeaten gold miners. In this case, a name that I used to own earlier in the year, the ticker NEM New Mount Corporation. Way oversold, as you can see in this weekly chart. If we have a rebound in gold, we will see lots of short covering in this name. What about Brent Oil? This is a four hours chart. It recaptured the resistance, now support, of 99. But we don't have a confirmation that this is solid support for now. It needs to be retested and we need to see a pop higher away from 99 in the northern direction. That would be a confirmation that we have more gains to come in oil. The next stop would be 105.84. Next, the 10-year yield. What's going on here? It is popping higher. Despite what the experts say, that the 10-year should be moving down because Fed tightening expectations are also moving down. They're going to do 50 instead of 75 in September. The bond market says not so fast. The bond market says high Higher yields are coming, higher interest rates are coming. We see the RSI, the MACD indicators all firming up higher, indicating that the next stop should be 3%. And then we have the TLT, a weekly chart. Look at that. This is a reversal candle, indicating the end of the short covering pop in the TLT. Assuming that the chart is going to close like this by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow. So watch out for the TLT. And next we have the VIX 4 hours chart. It is above 20 once again, but it is forming a bear flag pattern, which means that the VIX is at risk of moving down. However, if the level of 20 happens to be the bottom, just like we've seen throughout the year, then the VIX should be rebounding higher. But it's not going to be an easy job for the VIX to pop higher again because we have resistance number one at 21.53. But even if that's beaten, you see another line in yellow, upward sloping line. That was support line on the daily chart, that would be resistance two. And then we have resistance number three at around 24.29. So it's going to be a steep hill to climb for Mr. VIX. What about the VXN, four hours chart, the VIX for the NASDAQ? No conclusion here on the MACD indicator. It keeps going back and forth, back and forth, not giving us a clear signal. Despite the fact that the VXN is actually down, it lost an important support for 27 and a half. What does that mean? It could go either way in an impulsive fashion. Right now, it supports more downward action for the VXN, which means more upward action for the Qs. But be careful here. We have to combine other charts to come up with a conclusion. Charts such as the 30 minutes chart for the Qs, charts such as the daily chart of the NASDAQ futures showing a shooting star, charts like the dollar index, the 10 year yield, all of these will move the NASDAQ one way or the other. But an important chart to watch is Apple, the king of the NASDAQ. If it continues to pop higher, no problems here. The Nasdaq moves higher. But it appears that Apple is becoming really, really overextended. An impulsive, steep rally. All the way to almost all-time highs. Unbelievable. Specifically given the fact that Apple earnings were not really that good. The net income for the company was down 10% year over year. How could that be good news at all? But the retail crowd, mom and pops, are piling in, buying Apple, assuming that the worst is behind us. What they don't know is this is a massive trap, and Apple will go down to at least closing the gap at around 157. I see this as a gift, a nice short trade for a pullback and retracement to the support at around 157. If you have expiration dates in September, October, you'll be fine. But if you're chasing the ratty right now, assuming that Apple will go back to all-time highs, we'll be caught in the trap. Tesla, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? It made an attempt in trading above 886. That did not work out. And as you can see from the subsequent candles, 
it tried over and over and over again to crack above 886 that didn't happen then came the move back to the next support 866 calling for support over and over and over again support was nowhere to be found for the chart so it decided to move down again forming a bear flag consolidation pattern if the weakness continues the next stop would be closing the gap at around it's around number actually 850 and then we'll take it from there bitcoin what's going on here a two hours chart bitcoin has been giving lots of false signals bullish and bearish no problems here we talked about 24,250. the chart made it above that and then it went down to retest and it failed so what's going to happen from this point on here's what i'm looking at if the chart continues to move down it's going to retest the upper range of the consolidation if it rebounds higher it's going to go ahead and retest 24,250 as resistance if we have a break above so far so good no problems here but if this happens and the chart gets rejected again from 24,250 the chart would be forming a head and shoulder formation indicating once and for all that the break of the consolidation range will happen to the downside and lastly moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow we have the import price index this will be critically important for the outlook of inflation and then we have another important reading the university of michigan consumer sentiment index with this folks i'm done here this is all i got for you for now thank you for listening thank you for watching i will talk to you again tomorrow all good things to those who wait